<laughs> okay, I might as well try that at some point. Yeah, that looks interesting as well. Hi there. I have something to confess. I do read all the comments underneath my videos. I know, I know, it is a rarity among YouTube creators. But I cannot help it, because I'm always looking for new video ideas. And for years now, tons of viewers have been asking me to create a tube amplifier. In case you do not know, with tubes they refer to such vacuum tubes. Which kind of look like Nixie tubes, but are way more boring since they only light up a little bit. Such tryout vacuum tubes were actually invented in 1906. And they mostly have been replaced by the transistor, which was firstly created in 1947. And that basically makes vacuum tubes a relic of the past. Right? Well, if you search for tube amp on eBay, then you can actually still find lots of products that feature those old school vacuum tubes. Which begs the question, what makes them so special that after 100 years we still use them? To find that out, I actually ordered myself such a tube amplifier. And in this video, we will not only have a closer look at it, find out how vacuum tubes work, and how to create a simple audio preamplifier with them. But along the way, we will also uncover whether it truly makes sense to still use them. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by Altium. I recently switched to the Altium Designer software in order to create a schematic for my guitar effects board. And I have to say that it is a pretty good piece of software. It comes with everything you need to create a schematic. And what I really like is that you can search for components from online sellers. Which makes sourcing components for your project super simple. So feel free to test the Altium Designer by yourself by following the links in the video description. Firstly, let's have a closer look at the tube amplifier that I bought myself in the name of science for around 80 euro. I have to say that I really do like the fact that you can easily replace the tubes and the all metal enclosure looks and feels pretty high quality. All the knobs and outputs slash inputs also made a very good impression. For the inputs you can either connect a stereo signal through wires or connect to the amp via Bluetooth. And for the outputs you can either hook up speakers or simply plug in headphones. Now before taking anything apart I actually played back a couple of songs with this amplifier and then compared it to the audio output quality of my phone. I'm certainly no expert, but by listening to both devices side by side, I have to say that the tube amp offers a more pleasant sound spectrum. And pleasant is the keyword here, which besides warm or natural is often used to promote such tube amplifiers. So to determine whether those promotional terms are truly correct, let's unscrew all the screws required to remove the PCB. And once again, I was positively surprised with the products and its well-made PCB design. What I immediately noticed though, after unscrewing a big heatsink, is that there are tons of ICs on the PCB, which are also amplifiers. We got operational amplifiers, a headphone amplifier and also a powerful Class D amplifier. The Class D one is used for the speaker outputs and the headphone amplifier is obviously used for the headphone. So the only job the vacuum tubes fulfill is by pre-amplifying the original audio signal. But why only that? Well, the first reason comes to mind when googling the label 6J4 of the vacuum tube. As it turns out, my tubes are triodes, whose symbol looks like this. They can only handle a maximum current of 20 milliamps, which is certainly not enough to directly drive any kind of speaker. That means the real power amplification happens later with the other amp types. But why then bother with preamplification through the vacuum tubes? 
To find that out, let's have a look at the most important pins of our triode. Cold plates, which is the anode, cathode, grid and heater. As you might recall from your diode knowledge, current can only flow from the anode to the cathode, but not the other way around. That is the case for our triode as well. The cathode has an excess amount of electrons that can travel to the anodes because there is a lack of electrons. To make that happen though, we firstly have to power our heater pins. According to the datasheets, we have to apply 6.3 volts to them. And as you can see, after doing just that with my lab bench power supply, something starts glowing inside the tube and it becomes hotter. By the way, this heat, which is around 1.8 watts of electrical power, is an excess power loss that, for example, transistors do not have to deal with. But anyway, this heat is necessary to excite the electrons and make the current flow happen. Which brings us to the last pin, the grid. By applying a control signal to it, we basically present a negative charge to the electron path which repels the electrons and thus reduces the current flow. And just like that, we can use a low power control signal in order to control a higher power current flow, which is more or less the definition of amplification. To test the functionality of my tube, we can build up such a simple class A amplifier design with it. And in case you're wondering, creating a class A amp with a bipolar junction transistor requires pretty much the same circuit design. But there's one huge difference. While the BJT works with low voltages, which are safe to work with, the vacuum tube requires around 100 to 150 volts DC. And yes, my board product also uses 96 volts which is why the average consumer should probably not tinker around with it. But anyway, to create such a high DC voltage, I will be using this high voltage DC converter, which I originally ordered for my Nixie Clock project. After hooking up my multimeter to its output, I connected the input to 12 volts and used the onboard trimmer in order to adjust the output voltage to around 100 volts. With that being done, it was finally time to solder wires to the 7 pins of the 6J4 vacuum tube and connect them all to the complementary components which I showed you before in the schematic. And after a couple of minutes of soldering, the circuit was complete. For the signal inputs, I will be using my function generator, whose sine wave frequency I can not only change, but also its amplitude and offsets. After connecting it to the inputs, we can have a look at the outputs, which offered a bit of a surprise for me. If we look closely and play around with the input frequency, we can see that the amplification does occur. But why is there this weird waveform, which apparently messes with the ground reference potential? Well, if we zoom in on the waveform, we can determine a frequency of around 24.4 kHz, which coincidentally is the same frequency my high voltage boost converter utilizes. So in a nutshell, I got no suitable power supply for my tube amp, but since my board product uses a similar circuit design, we can simply have a look at it instead. As you can see, the amplification works without any problems. But as a comparison, let's build up the same class A amplifier circuits with a BC637NPN BJT. After connecting the input signal and power, we can once again have a look at the outputs, in order to find out that we basically got the same waveform results as with the tube. So why should we bother with them? since they require high voltage and create excess power losses through heat. Maybe they create less distortion? To answer that question, we can firstly browse through the transistor's datasheets, in order to find this graph, which describes the relation between the flowing collector current and the collector emitter voltage. For an audio amplifier, you want this line to be very linear so that the amplified signal does not get distorted, 
which is the case with this BC637. Now let's have a look at the lines of the vacuum tube, which are also kind of linear, but feature noticeably more curves. That means that this tube will also create more distortions than the transistor. And while this sounds bad, the distortions are also kind of the reason why tube amps are still relevant. You see, some people just find those distortions more pleasant to hear, and they describe it as warm or natural. It is pretty much subjective. Supposedly, tube amps do also not create high frequency harmonics, which might be another favorable characteristic for their sound, which makes people like them. The only real advantage they offer is that they do not clip like transistors when overdriven. And with those information now all in your heads, I can firmly state that the tube preamplifier of my bot products might add its own distortions to the mix, but I really do not care or hear them that much. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this small history class and now understand why I have pretty much no interest in creating my own proper tube amplifier system. And by the way, you can check out the video description to find more videos about the topic of different amplifier classes and transistors, just in case you got confused once or twice during this video. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!